Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Five One Speedway Show. Hopefully, you've all caught up and you have enjoyed every single episode so far that's been on. Today, my guest is a legend of both speedway and grass track, and even long track. Uh, he's had a, a whole host of clubs, mainly with Lakeside Slasher in your Essex. Uh, he's back riding again for comeback number three or four, I think it is. I'm not too sure. Uh, with, with Kent in 2021, please welcome to the show, Paul Hurry. Yo, mate. Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so, how, how have you been in the in lockdown and all the pandemic and everything else? Um, yeah, no, it's, it's been pretty normal, really, for me. Um, I've been working for DEP, making the motocross exhaust pipes. Yeah. Um, and believe it or not, through this sort of all this nightmare, it's the busiest I've ever been. So, um, yeah, we've been mega busy. Um, <laughs> and obviously, it's it was a bit of a touchy subject to start with. Obviously, are we sort of needed to be, you know, should we still be open? Um, but a few of the pipes go to ambulance bikes or paramedics. So, um, yeah, obviously they need their bikes and we need to fix their pipes. So um, that's how we stayed open. Nice. So you are technically classed as a key worker in some respect because you're doing exhaust pipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some sort of description, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that feeling because I'm postman, so I'm in class as a key worker since the whole pandemic. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, cool. two, two key workers right here. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, obviously, why we're here tonight is to talk about uh, your long and illustrious career. Like I said in the intro, you've had, run for many, many clubs uh, and also had a, a few scrapes along the way um, and, and things like that. But um, how did your sort of riding career start then? I know it started on the grass track, but how did you sort of like get the buzz to go racing then? Um, obviously, my me, me dad um, rode for, yeah, quite a few years. Um, and... It sort of just spot get yeah, come on from there really. Um, I, was, I was quite into football um, as a kid, um, and I went for trials at Tottenham and all that stuff. Um, and it, I think I was about eleven, come twelve. Um, Dad was meant to have a grass track on a on a Sunday, and it got rained off um, quite early. I think it was on a Friday or something. And he was sort of, yeah, I think he was laid in the bath at the time, thinking. And he said, well, and he shouted out to me, do you fancy doing a grass track at the weekend? And I'm like, it's strange. Obviously, I had a motocross bike and, and yeah, we used to go on it a fair bit. Um, and that was it. He put me into a grass track on the Sunday because he had nothing to do. And we went from there. Um, I think I'd done two or three meetings that season. Um, and then the following year, he bought me a proper grass track bike. Um, and I was I was sort of keen at the time um, well yeah I was keen um, <laughs> anything to do with speedways well, I, yeah I wanted to be a speedway rider yeah. um, and then he went off to his grass shack meeting and my mum took me and we got to this particular meeting and I think the gear lever broke or, or dropped off or something um, my mum wasn't very mechanically minded as mm. most women aren't um, <laughs> Probably get bollocking for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and the first person that came over to us to help us was um, Paul Laurent. Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, yeah, that was it really. We sort of struck up a friendship with him from there. Um, and yeah, to this day, I'm sort of, yeah, one of my best mates is Mark. So mm. um, yeah, it went on from there really. Nice. So then obviously then that obviously snowballed and you went through the the, uh, the junior ranks of grass track. Did you manage to win a few uh, national titles at uh, junior level? Yeah, I did. I was, I was quite a slow learner. Um, yeah, I still am. Um, yeah, it took me quite a few years. I think it was the last season that I was in the in the youth. Um, I won most things that year, but obviously it took probably sort of six or seven years to get to that standard. Um, but yeah, in, in the meantime, we had a really good sort of lifestyle and enjoyed myself. And yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that's good, because also, wasn't it, you became like the Hackney mascot as well uh, for a couple of years? Yeah, well, that, obviously, that all spiralled from sort of meeting with Mark and, and Paul. <laughs> um, and then sort of from those days, um, I think it was my second year, Dad sponsored Mark, um, because obviously Dad had to retire then, or didn't have to, but he, he couldn't concentrate while I was riding. Um so what he done, he stopped riding, and then the 350 grass shack bike that he had, he got the engine sleeve down, and then sponsored Mark with it in the 250 class. Um, and then the following year after that, Mark says, "Well, 
why doesn't Paul have my grass track bike, the, the previous, the 150, I think it was, and use it for speedway? So that's what we've done. I did the 150 speedway bike to start with. And that's when Mark signed for Hackney and I become the mascot. So, um, yeah, it sort of rolled on from there. Yeah, because I think there's a couple of team photos with, with the young you at the very front. Of course, you got the when we went to National League, you had Mark, Chris Louis, Mogo, Barry Thomas, you know, all that lot all around you, especially when they, when they won the league. Do you remember much riding around um, Hackney, the old Hackney? Oh, yeah. Were, yeah, they were, to, to be fair, like I, was, I was only speaking to my dad this morning. Um, they were probably the best days ever mm. of, my, of my career. Um, going to Hackney on a Friday. Um, and whatever, like, it, it's quite funny, really, because, like, all Mark's equipment, I used to have hand-me-downs. Oh, yeah. And there's a, <laughs> there's a couple of pictures where I've got a set of his levers on. He, he's obviously, he sparked the crutch out of them and, and didn't <laughs> wear them, but I had them on. So I'm in the picture. I'm proud as punch because I've got Mark's levers on. All, all the front, like, the crutch is all split out of them. I'm like, <laughs> quite embarrassing, really. But, um, yeah, no, they were great days. Sort of, mm. yeah, with sort of starting with Mark and Simo and Simon Week and then the following year with Andy Galvin and Alan Mogridge. So, yeah, it's, it's great times. Yeah, and obviously then at that, obviously, you gently progressed as you went along the old Spiro career. Did you manage to go to many other places other than Hackney then to practice, like I Wade or Eastbourne or places like that? Yeah, um, obviously through the winter, we used to go to Iways. Mm. Um, and it's quite funny now because um, there was a guy that my dad used to do his bikes when he was in the youth, a guy called Jeff Sims. Okay. And if, if you go up the M1 or M25, you'll see Sims Million Machines and it's him. Um. And he's got this like multi-million com- pound company now. And he used to come to Iway because on the Sunday and ride his speedway bike. And all through the winter, if it was frozen, he was really good at driving JCBs. Mm. He used to get in the digger and take off like, I don't know, two or three centimetres or inches off the track so that we could ride. Oh, right. And it, yeah, we was riding up there in all, all types of weather. Um, but yeah, like a, a typical time, we would sort of Friday night was to Hackney um, for the sort of main meeting. And I'd go out before the meeting with Ben Howe, sometimes oh, yeah. Justin Elkins used to ride. And then again afterwards, and then we'd come back, and then on Saturday, we'd go back up there at 11 o'clock for practice all day long. Um, only then to come home and take the speedway bike out and put a grass track bike in to go and ride grass track on a Sunday. And when, when you sort of think back, I would have probably rode sort of 11 or 12 times on a Saturday and then done seven or eight rides on a Sunday. <laughs> There's no <laughs> way I could do that now. <laughs> no, you're sort of dead by Monday. Sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, they wonder why I didn't want to go to school Monday. <laughs> yeah, you can get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a nightmare. No, but obviously, like you said, it helped you, obviously, you both, your speedway and grass track career in the early days. Obviously, you must have bounced off each other, really, you know, and things like that, because that extra track time and everything. But obviously, that's the old way of, of learning. You know, unlike nowadays, where it's either speedway or grass track, it seems to be nowadays, uh, back then it was both. Because obviously, they say yourself, Mark, uh, Joe Screen, Javi, and people like that have all done that sort of progress. Yeah, it's a shame, really, because obviously the grass track scene, or the youth grass track scene, has all but disappeared. Mm. Um, and when you look at the riders that have come through that, um, even, yeah, even Scotty was riding when when I was um, in the youth. Um, and it, it's sort of, it's a shame because it prepares you. Mm. You can always sort of look at, like a good grass track rider can become a good speedway rider. Yeah. But it's sometimes a little bit difficult for a speedway rider to become a really good grass track rider. Um, and like yeah when you when you ride a sort of rough grass track you sort of get to a what they call an unrideable speedway track now and you think well no, that's that's pretty cool we can get on with that <laughs> um, so yeah it just made you a good all rounder really um, mm-hmm. so it is a shame now that the kids haven't got that or well, much of an option now um, mm-hmm. but yeah you never know what, what the future can sort of bring if we can get something going again yeah, and obviously with you being sort of part with your dad sort of thing, part of Astra and sort of like the Kent and Sussex sort of grass track and youth and that sort of thing, do you reckon there's going to be a surge of possible new riders or people interested in grass track then in the future? Can you see that sort of happening? Um, it's going to be difficult. Um, obviously, like today's climate, obviously what we're going for at the moment is just, yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, but then away from that, even yeah, before this nightmare situation it, um, I'm not so sure if we can um, because there's so many different things that people are doing now mm. um, 
and when you look at sort of around this area, the ground that was used for sort of motocross or grass track is coming sort of, yeah, it's difficult to get it um, because of sort of people building the noises and it's, it's just a different sort of time in the world at the moment. So, yeah, I, I never say never. It's, it's never going to come back, but it's going to be difficult. So it's unlike, I think, kind of with Speedway, where you're at a fixed stadium, whereas grass track, most of the time you're going from one field to another field sort of thing. You know, I mean, look at, you've got Frittenden and then you've got like Dig Dog Lane yeah, over down this way and places like that, you know. You can't, you're not really sort of fixed in one place. You can't say to people, oh, we're open this Sunday, that Sunday. You know, it's only maybe two or three times a year that you're open. Exactly. And that's, to be honest, that's probably a problem because we haven't got like a permanent venue mm. where that's what we need. Um it was ideal with Collier Street, but that went a little bit pear shaped. Um, but yeah, it, we would be better off if we had a permanent sort of yeah grass track come long track. Mm. Um, but even to a degree with like the speedway now, you sort of see these the stadiums. It was only the other day that I, I was talking to someone and we we were talking about the, the sort of tracks that we used to ride on, Rye House, yeah, Hackney. Lakeside, Wimbledon, and then you sort of stand and you think, yeah, they've all gone. Mm. Um, so it's not just, yeah, it's not sort of the grass tracks that are sort of falling away, it's, it's the speedway tracks. And obviously, yeah, in time, it seems to be dwindling away. Yeah, because obviously, I think with stadiums you know, nowadays, I mean, you look at obviously like Poland and like that, uh, they're massive stadiums and things like that. I mean, we've got, we're fortunate to have obviously Bellevue fantastic stadium but unfortunately you don't have one in the midlands you don't have one in the south you don't have one down in down in cornwall and devon that that sort of capacity sort of stadium unfortunately but maybe in the future i mean also we had one in the midlands which was coventry so obviously that was a great great venue to have speedway and stuff like that at. but like you said yeah i agree with you you know both speedway and grass track bounce off each other really and if one sort of fails the other one slowly goes the same way it isn't it, it at the moment it just I know everything's a bit doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. Um but when you look at Poland and to degree a little bit Sweden, um you've got to take your hat off to them. Um and I've yeah, I know just recently I've been banging the drum a little bit, is that we need independent people running the BSBA. Yeah. Um I know yeah, everyone's gonna jump on the bandwagon and but at the end of the day it's what's needed mm. um, because at the moment we're on sort of a, a slowly sinking ship. Mm. Um, and I think most of the sort of people that are on that governing body, um, <laughs> there's too many, to, what's, I can't really, I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> yeah. Conflicts of interest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and they don't look at the bigger picture. Like you say, you, you look at Poland and, and Sweden Um and they're all clubs. Mm. Where when you look at our our sort of leagues, the, the clubs are clubs, but they're not because they're normally are run by someone in charge. Yeah, and one person sort of says that's what's happening, and this is what's happening. Mm. Um, and if you you don't like the, the way he's playing with his train set, he gets young and <laughs> says you're not playing with it no more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit. What's the word? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's too much conflict. Down, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like too much like conflict, isn't there? One person trying to be better than the other person, and, yeah. and vice versa. It's almost like sometimes I think. I mean, obviously, look at Paul for example. You know, in the elite league, dominant for the whole of the early two thousands and things like that. You know, and then obviously now they've dropped. They've had to drop down. So that drop down the league because I don't think they can financially do well in the top league. You know, because I don't think sponsors or anything there. Obviously, I don't know because I don't know what the situation at Paul is. But I'm only using that as an example. You know. And things like that and then obviously you look at the other side of it like mm-hmm. like Eastbourne you know we're going top flight again for so many years had to drop down two divisions to survive to National League and then they've come back up to the championship and they're now in the championship so so yeah it is a case of I think a very fine balancing act you know but like you say I think there needs to be some sort of uh, all round look at the whole picture you know this five year programme or four year programme whatever it was for the, for the British youth you know again great idea but they've got to stick by it for the next four or five years and things like that. And yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a good thing. I mean, we've, they should have been doing this years ago, mm-hmm. not just now. I mean, I, I do feel that they're probably... 
to have gone on sack. They are like, I think it's done for a reason. And I think if they didn't do this, then Eurosports might be saying, well, hold on a minute, what's yeah. there to look at? Because we've got no Grand Prix riders in your league or in this league. Um, yeah, it's, it's marvellous. Brilliant. But <laughs> two years' time, where are these riders going to be coming from? Yeah, exactly. And will, will they have forgotten this? Mm. What they said they're going to do. I right, to, to God they don't, and they need to sort of. They need to have a, a feeding ground um, to bring the riders on. Um, and it it's baffling. And just recently, it, it is sort of it does reading because one step by saying we, we want to bring the youth on and do this and do that. Yeah, great. Well, then on the other foot, they're sort of stamping on national league and they're on finishing it. Yeah. But where where are these kids going to come from? You know, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it is baffling. Don't, don't worry, because I, I, I recently stopped in my own racing career because there was no progression for myself. You know, I used to get flung into National League, do one, two meetings, chucked in at number two or reserve three rides and I went home sort of thing. You know, I, 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 I never had consistent race against top boys. I used to do the Development League. If I did well in the Development League, they'd be in the National League team for one meeting. Like it'd be like I'll be going somewhere with someone to the Isle of Wight, have seven rides, score two points, but then but I'm not up to that sort of level yet because I haven't ridden consistently against that sort of level. So that's where my own personal sort of battle had been. And I had like one good year uh, at development level, think, oh yeah, this is it, my breakthrough year. I'm going to get something. Nothing. Nobody came to me. No, no, no nothing. You just think, well, what am I doing it for? You know, I'm not exactly. progressing forward. I'm not given the chance to stay on that level, but. You know, it's spooky. <laughs> yeah, but it is, and it, you know, what I mean, there's the people there that are interested and want to do it, but there's no sort of path for them. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a headbanger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we're, 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 we're Move away from this because uh, most of my <laughs> most of my interviews end up going to politics, and we shouldn't really talk about politics. You get in trouble otherwise. Uh, it's been, it, I mean, at the moment, it, it, it's an ideal opportunity, wasn't it? It's, it's like the reset button's been pressed on the whole wide world. Exactly. And it would have been an ideal opportunity to have pressed it on on Speedway and mm. gone back a few steps to come forward a few steps. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see a lot more junior tracks prop up and things like that just to give the kids a chance to progress because I mean it's a right grabbing uh, motocrossers or, or whoever and chuck them on a 500 spear bike but like, they don't learn anything by jumping from a motocross bike onto a spear bike they, they don't do the progression like I did no, exactly. like, like you did so you know but uh, anyway we'll go back to your, onto your career I think you know it's a bit more, <laughs> a bit more fun you know but um, in 1991 you managed to I think it was you joined Arena Essex as your first club in the second division and just went on to win the league. So, what do you, what do you remember about that that year then? Um, yeah, it was great. You couldn't really <laughs> sort of wish for a better start, really. Um, I can remember starting and thinking, Jesus, this is a bit different to riding around, sort of doing demonstrations, mm. sort of, yeah, um, practice days. But, yeah, no, it was great. Obviously, being in the same team as Bo Peterson, Andy Galvin, Moggo, mm. um, and then Brian Cargo coming to the team later on. And Troy Pratt, yeah, it was great, and it was a great atmosphere. Um, I learned a lot, so yeah, no, it was good. That was good then, because obviously, you know, what was you 16 when you first joined, 16, 17, then, and yeah, 16, because I, I couldn't start at the start of the season because I wasn't old enough, <laughs> so I think it was, I think I missed about five or six meetings, yeah, and then on my 16th birthday, which was on a Tuesday, we was at Milton Keynes that night, or that evening, yeah, that evening, mm. so. I'll make a debut on my 16th birthday, so it was a bit, a bit different. Yeah, how how'd you get on your first meeting? Do you remember? I don't know if I got one or two, I think. Oh, that's so right. start again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it can't be bad, though, because obviously, you know, let's say just starting off and you win the league in your first year, you know, you can't really ask for much better than that. No, it was, it, I think I've done all right. I held my own. Um, I think I've done if I got a four or five point average, but there was times that we went to Middlesbrough for the first time, and I'd never ever been to the place. I think I got about 13 or 14. It was a bit different then because obviously you couldn't do, oh, I couldn't do nothing wrong that night. No. Um, but you have meetings like that sort of every now and then. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. And also, like the Northern Tour trips and things like that must have been fun with, like you say, Andy Elvin, Mogo, Peterson, and people like that. Yeah, they were great times. When you, <laughs> when you sort of see what they got up to and the jokes they used to play, yeah, it's brilliant. Did you manage to copy any of those jokes? <laughs> um, yeah. We, yeah, I suppose it sort of it sets you in good stead for later on in life. Mm. Um, 
Like we we were going up the motorway in all four lanes with the hard shoulder. Yeah. There was four there was vans across no one could get by us. <laughs> and things like that. And you just yeah, it's yeah, it's nice. Character yeah. building, I suppose. You're thinking what am I let myself in for, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously when you're sixteen you're thinking, yeah, we're gonna get done here, but yeah, yeah, you've got to wave quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I can't, well, you we can't get away with it nowadays, but you could then. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, a few cameras around now. Yeah, exactly. But obviously, Arena Essex, I think, got promotion in '92 then because they won the league in in '91. But obviously, you started to stay down in the second division. Stay, you went on to uh, was it to Peterborough? I think you went on to next, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, mainly because I didn't really think I was ready to move up a league. Um, and again, that was. That was really good to go there um, with Mick Paul, Stephen Davies, Jason Crump. Um, I think Mark Blackbird was there as well. Rod Cahoon. Yeah, it's a really good bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, then I think also you retained the title with, with Peterborough as well that year, I think in 92. Yeah, really. yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it was really good. <laughs> but yeah, the only reason I went there is because I wanted to go to a bigger track as well. Mm. Obviously, riding all sort of little tracks. Up until I signed when I was 16, yeah, I needed to get on a big track and sort of learn to keep the biking line a little bit more. Um, you know, it was a really good couple of years there. Yeah, because obviously you say of 93, you know, things like that. So obviously, like you said, going to a bigger track. I mean, obviously you used to ride the big tracks on the grass track and maybe dabbling a bit of long track back then. But, you know, it's no diff- It's a bit different to riding a spirit bike on a big track than it is to a grass track. Yeah. Um, uh, to be honest, I've still got a little bit of bad habits on little tracks. I just keep... I, I, when I get to sort of big tracks, I back it in all the time and lock up and hang off with it. And but yeah, it's it's what it is. Um, yeah. It probably didn't help. But I didn't go to Poland for longer than what I did. Mm. Um, had I done that, I'd have probably been a little bit better and yeah, gotten a bit better on speedway. But yeah, I, I chose to go down the grass track route. Mm. Um, yeah, I can't really complain really. Ah, I've no complaints so far, is there? So you're all good. <laughs> but, not, but obviously, then in '94, you decided to you thought thought you were ready, and you went up to uh, Arena Essex again for a couple of years uh, at the top league level. And obviously, '95 is when the amalgamation happened of all, all the leagues and things like that. But what was your sort of like first impressions when you went to the British League then in '94? <coughs> um, it was probably quite a sort of a growing up year really um, the end of 93 I went to South Africa mm. on tour um, obviously it's the first time I've been away from home um, so it made me grow up a little bit and sort of realise what, what goes on in the world mm-hmm. um, so when I come back from there obviously yeah I decided that I wanted to go up a league um, went back to Lakeside um, or the Ring Essex um, and yeah it, it sort of it went from there I think that was probably quite a progressive year that year for me um i started using carl bloomfield to do my engines um i just gained a little bit more confidence i think obviously being away on your own defending for yourself it was like a big sort of wake-up call mm. yeah it sort of opens your eyes up to what you have to do to look after yourself and and, exactly. and things like that not necessarily the same the bikes but it's looking after you you know living eating and everything else really isn't it yeah yeah and obviously yeah when when you're out there and you you've got to prepare yourself and get everything organised and yeah, it sort of rolls on when you come back here. But you come back home, but it's a lot easier mm-hmm. because you've got a bit more help. But when I was out there, you, there was no one there to help you. You've got to do it yourself. Um, yeah. And so in some ways you sort of look at the youth today <clears throat> and you sort of think some of the sort of British riders, you think they could probably do with going to Poland, which they should do. Mm-hmm. So they can sort of, escape the nest sort of thing and have that experience and then come back and it, it would definitely make him a, a better rider and a better person. Yeah, I think if they went to any sort of country abroad, you know, not necessarily just Poland, but like even if I went to Sweden, to Denmark or wherever, I mean, you look at the kids who went out there last year with, with Tom Brennan, Jason Edwards, uh, Drew and Anders Rowe and people like that, all who ventured out there to, to dabble in it and they've all come back as better riders and you know, they're, they're getting contracts to ride abroad now. Exactly, and that's what that's what they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you sort of look at Robert Lambert, yeah. what he's done and how he's come up to the level that he's come up to, I mean that's near on perfect, I think. Yeah. And what sort of rider he's, he's turned into. So yeah, and like it, it's good that they're taking notice and, and sort of trying to do that. 
Yeah, exactly. But it wasn't like that back in your day. It's a bit, it's a bit harder back then, probably. It was a little bit harder, but then we still had the opportunities to do those sort of things. Mm. Um, and yeah, you, you have to sort of come out of your comfort zone. Yeah, it's very easy to stay in your comfort zone. Mm. Um, I think I've said it before. When you look at Edward and Lewis Bridger, yeah, how much talent they've got on the bike. If they would have stuck at it and gone to Sweden and Poland every week. Mm. God only knows what sort of riders they were turned into. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but then Eddie then has done well on the grass because he hasn't necessarily progressed on the speedway front on Poland or Sweden. He's done well on the grass and the long track. So, you know, maybe it's a flip side for him. It has. Um, it's out. Yeah, he, he's done well on the grass track. But you just feel that he could have done a whole whole lot more on, on the speedway and could have gone further. Yeah. Um, you know, he's got the ability in... Yeah, he's got style, so it's just a shame he didn't sort of push that way a little bit more. Yeah, especially when you look at some like Ty, for example. Ty, Ed, Lewis are all sort of around the same sort of age, you know, and things like that. And Ty is the only one who really sort of went forward, really, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, unfortunately, Ed and Lewis were staggered. Well, Lewis kept stopping the start and, and things like that. I mean, it's great to see Lewis back again for next or this year now. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how he goes, being as fit as what he is and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, but also it's about surrounding yourself with the right people as well to to encourage you probably to do that sort of thing. And maybe if you, like you say, you're too comfort comfy at home, then that's what holds you back. Exactly. If things are nice and you're, you're enjoying yourself, you don't want to sort of upset the apple cart. No. <clears throat> but yeah, when you look at sort of Thai and people like that, they they sort of strive to go forward and they come out of their comfort zone quite often. Yeah, yeah, they do very much so. But um, looking back again at your career, ninety-five when the leagues all went together, and again in ninety-six when the leagues were still together. How do you think? How do you how did you sort of approach that sort of season? And the thing that oh, I'd be a lot more busier, different tracks, different teams, different riders. And was it? Do you think it was a good thing? Yeah, I think it was. It's a shame we've not done it this year. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was. Yeah, it was much better. Well, it wasn't much better, but it was just a, what they'd done, and you just got on with it. Um, but yeah, it was great because you wasn't going to track sort of three or four times a year. You'd sort of mm. go there twice, tops. <coughs> um, and so yeah, it was nice because you've seen different sort of tracks and different people and yeah, it was an enjoyable year. Yeah, exactly. But one thing I must touch on also in 94 is that you managed to win the British Under 21 Championship as well. So that must have been a good little feather in your cap on the speedway front. Yeah, yeah, that's at Long Eaton, I think. Mm. Um yeah, so I'd, I'd done it the year before in '93, I think, at Long Eaton. Um, we got a few points, but then like the next year, as I started to grow up a little bit, I realised that I need to sort of get my arse in gear. And yeah, no, it was good. Um, you sort of don't remember everything, but you remember sort of the, yeah, going to the meeting, being nervous, and then sort of winning your first couple of rides and thinking, shit. Yeah. Sort of keep going there. Um, but yeah, no, it was good. And there was always that little bit of rivalry between me and Ben Howe. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was good. So, yeah. you know, it was, it was all right. Yeah, it was right. Did you manage to progress onto the world of the 21 scene at all, or did you knock out the qualifying round? <laughs> um, I didn't. Um, I think that year I was in Poland, in Lesno, I think. All right. Or Piwa, I can't remember. But, yeah, to, to be honest, what, what sort of let myself down, really... Was nine times out of ten, if we had an under twenty one round, I'd be in Germany or somewhere the next day, a grass track or a long track. All oh, right. Um, so I'd always send my kit out there and not really worry about the long the under twenty one, mm. but want to do well in the long track and, and grass track. Um, so I think again, I should have paid more attention to the speedway rather than me sort of grass track and long track. The grass track and long track is your, is your passion and your love really more than anything. I think more than the speedway probably. Yeah, it was. Um, obviously, where Dad sort of done it, mm. um, and I grew up doing it, um, and obviously where, where we are sort of living, um, mm. there's a lot of grass track going on, so it's always sort of, yeah, my first choice, really. Yeah, yeah, 100%, you know, things like that. But obviously, looking again on the speedway front, 96, you managed to move to, or Arena, move to, to London, to the new Hackney Stadium um for for a season how did you sort of find that obviously comparing it to the old hackney to the new hackney what was the difference there then was it uh, much difference yeah it was never the same <laughs> you were sort of yeah. hoping it was gonna be and you was hoping the track was gonna be the same yeah. <coughs> um 
but yeah, no, it was never, it was never the hackney. Um, before the season started, you was yeah, every, everyone hoped that it was going to be like the Friday night, and mm. but the way that it was all set out, it's just there wasn't a lot of atmosphere there. Okay, um, yeah. The track wasn't quite the same. The banking wasn't as good, um, and it was quite long and quite narrow going to the corners. Mm. So yeah, it, although it was good and it was run by Terry and Ivan, which was really professional and everyone got looked after, it just wasn't wasn't the same. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't like the old days sort of thing. No, no. I mean, all the people that were there that used to go, but again, when you sort of take away that. <clears throat> that history with the place and the, you can't put that back. No, exactly. You can't. Because I had um, Chris Lurie on here before and he said the similar sort of thing that, you know, it was never the same when he went there, even for the, the 95 Grand Prix. You know, it just didn't feel the same. didn't ride the same. You know, it's just, he said it was like too long and thin, really, for, for what it should have been. You know, he reckons if he brought it in a bit more, made a bit more of the corners or a rounder shape, you know, the track would have been a lot better. Yeah, it would have been. They needed to... Although, yeah, it was really sort of long and narrow, um, whereas the old one was a little bit more wider and you could race into the corner and go up the banking up to the fence and <clears throat> come back down. But there, it was just flat. Yeah. Um, and the material wasn't that great on it neither. It was just like sand. So when you sort of pass someone's back door, it stopped you. Mm. So you couldn't really race that sort of hard round there. No, because I've got a few DVDs of, of um, when it was the league meetings when like Eastbourne were there and the fours qualifiers and then you, you can see the track how it used to break up and and like the base wouldn't wasn't laid in time sort of thing you know you could just see it all unfortunately the, the for the stadium that it was you know it should have been a, a prime speedway track but unfortunately it never really happens I think everything was rushed too much to, just to get the track in and things mm. like that yeah it was done sort of a wing and a prayer for that first Grand Prix they had there. Mm. <laughs> so it was a bit of a, uh, I suppose, a bit of an anticlimax, really, because we was all sort of open to big things, and it, yeah, it went tits up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it didn't cut. It didn't stay at all after '96. Unfortunately, you know, it's a shame because obviously, again, that that would have been perfect for Speedway, you know, to have it a, would have been a track yeah. in London sort of thing again. But obviously, that was also the time when the laydowns came in in 96 I've asked other guys these these the same question but how did you sort of adapt from the uprights to the lay down or was it because you already ridden it on the grass track that you had some sort of knowledge of the lay down already yeah no I, I sort of you know, adapted quite well obviously doing two or three years on a, on long track mm. um, you sort of had the basic idea of what what way you wanted to go um, so yeah no we, we jumped on them and even around there where it was a little bit patchy we tended to yeah sort of getting quite a good ride on them. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's what it is. You have to follow sort of technology, don't you? Progression. Yeah, yeah technology and everything else. And obviously the laydowns must have been good because everyone's stuck by them. And we're still on them now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't... Personally, I don't think it was a very good thing, like, it, for the goodness of the sport, but yeah. <clears throat> that's another thing. Yeah, unfortunately nowadays the laydowns are just, it's just, everything's just cost, cost, cost. You know, it's, uh, you know, un unlike the old uprights, which probably could run for near enough forever, a few services a year, you could get them out, out of the way sort of thing. Yeah, and that's, yes, that's it. Yeah. So you can't stop progression, can you? No, no, you can't. That's unfortunate, but it's the way it went. But uh, obviously after after London closed, which was obviously very disappointing, um, was that you went on to, to Kings Lynn in 97. Um, was that sort of a, a track you're looking to go to? A nice big, again, a nice big open track. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really think I'd be or think I'd go there. Uh, it wasn't one of my favourite tracks. Um, but Ivan, when Terry and Ivan sort of parted company at London, I don't think Terry done anything the following year. And Ivan went to Kings Lynn, mm. um, so that's why I went to Kings Lynn. Um, <clears throat> and obviously Wiggy was there as well. Um, and Simo, so that's part of the reason I went there. Yeah, good again, grass track backgrounds, you know. I mean, to have Simon as your teammate must have been amazing to be. Yeah, it was. And obviously, that first year that I rode Group Speedway in 87, he was obviously number one at Hackney. Um, and obviously, me, me dad knew him pretty well from the grass track days and his, his brother Julian. Um, so yeah, sort of looking up with Simon, obviously, I was, I was only a little shaver when he sort of knew me dad. and. <laughs> Well, he'd known me all, all my life. Um, 
so yeah, it was sort of different, sort of looking up to Simon like I did and then riding with him. It was, yeah, definitely eye opening. Especially, I can imagine you had many battles as it was on the grass track and the long track already previous, you know, like that makes it like the Ace of Aces, the burn up, places like that, you know, and obviously whatever you did on the continent, imagine that you two were obviously firm rivals with great mates as well. Yeah, it was, I was always sort of, what's the word? I was always looking up to him. Yeah. Like, although I wanted to beat him, he sort of a year old and I couldn't really, I don't know, really, I couldn't really get to him anyway because I wasn't quick enough. Um, <laughs> But there was a couple of times I sort of got close, but yeah, he'd never let me beat him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I bet he wouldn't. No, no. L- l- unless you broke down. That's the only time you beat him. Broke down. <laughs> yeah. Same time I did, I Yeah, exactly. But obviously, you know, it must have been a good year at Kingston. That was the time also, again, where it was the uh, six riders in a team and things like that. You know, again, something different. That's when the Elite League all formed. And obviously, you still had Bradford in there and things like that. So it must have been, again, a hard year in the British League because obviously, still having a lot of top names in there. Yeah, it was, and obviously a lot of Grand Prix riders. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was different. You know, obviously, like you say, going to sort of places like Bradford <clears throat> um, and all those sort of big places, it, yeah, it was good. Mm. Yeah, very much like a, a long track on Speedway, you know, when you go to Bradford and places like that, I can imagine. Yeah, no, it was, it was totally different. But obviously, like I said earlier on, I still had those little bad habits of, on the turn going into the corners and hanging off the side of it yeah it didn't help matters but yeah no we, we had a good time and I've got some results every now and then yeah that's what matters I've got a few results you know <laughs> <laughs> and things like pays that the bills. Yeah, oh yeah pays the bills that's, that's the main thing get the old uh, bills out of the way but um, also in, in 97 was the first year of the old Brian Bonanza uh, obviously you managed to win win the first one what was that when you got the call from Martin saying you wanted to go out and do this indoor speedway what did he say to you then um, <clears throat> it's funny because when I was 16, that third in 91, mm. they'd done one in Manchester. Oh, yes. Um, and Dave Pavitt that sort of organized it. Obviously, we had the connection of when I started riding when I was 13. Mm. Um, he said to me, Dad, well, does Paul want to come up and be reserve? Um, and obviously I jumped at the chance because obviously being a kid and watching the sort of Wembley indoors and that, I loved it. Um, <clears throat> and it's funny because where Dad worked and Mark Lauren worked there for a little bit as well on screening, it was quite a big warehouse. So the week before this indoor thing in Manchester, Dad just vacated it and moved to a different premises. So Dad said we said the keys. So we went up there and had a practice. And that was, yeah, definitely different. Um, and so, yeah, so when I went to this GMX thing, um, we went out for practice and I was with Mark and Joe practicing, obviously being friends with them. And yeah, that's your sort of grouped up with. And we were going quite quick and I was staying with them and I was thinking, this is quite good. Um, but then a couple of the others, I think Sam and Lenko was one of them, complained that I wasn't old enough to go in the meeting. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't ride in it. Oh, no. Um, and as it went on, I think Mark won it, or Screeny won it, and Mark was second, or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So I was probably going right then. Um, but then when, yeah, Martin and Cookie, I think it was, yeah. told me about doing the indoor one at Brighton, I was, yeah, I was up for that. Yeah. So um, it was definitely enjoyable. Good. Was the one in Manchester on, on concrete then? Yeah, it's concrete, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you've ridden all types now, haven't you? You've done concrete, grass, ice. Well, I am... <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 96. We'd done one in Barcelona as well, oh, right, in the yeah. Olympic Basketball Hall, um, with Barry Briggs, that was. Mm. Um, I think I won that as well. <laughs> I did. So that's, so that's, yeah, it sort of rolled on from there, really. Oh, nice. So was that like, a, again, a, a hand-picked a bunch of riders that went out to Barcelona to try and film Speedway out to Spain then sort of thing? Yeah, it was. It was at the um, World Indoor Trials Round. Mm-hmm. Um, they put like an oval around the outside of the trial sections. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think it was me, Brian Anderson, Chris Louie, um, Ben Howe, Scotty. Um, I think there's a few Americans there as well. Mm-hmm. I can't remember all of them. Probably some <laughs> Germans. And, but no, it was good. Oh, it was an actual like, little proper meeting, not like demonstration races. No, it was a thing. proper, I think there was 24 of us. Oh, that's good then. So it's quite a big, yeah. 
definitely different because there was sort of, I think it was about 15,000, 20,000 people there as well. So, yeah. yeah. It's just, it is surprising that Spain didn't really take on Speedway, really. You know, with, considering yeah, they, they, like, they like all their other motorsports, but they don't like Speedway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like MotoGP, Trials, Enduro. Mm. Yeah, no track racing. No, no, weird. <laughs> well, weird, weird people. I speak funny anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, that, that, that indoor, you must have liked it because you, you won the, the individual there, you know, and things like that. And obviously, that was the first year they laid it all on boards and things like that, you know, and stuff like that. So it must have been a, an experience in itself. Yeah, it's just one of those things that you do with sort of an open mind and it's that time of year where you just want to enjoy yourself. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that no, was good. It was a good atmosphere. Yeah. And at the time, I sort of had a few sort of family people around me as well that come from Brighton. So, mm. you yeah, know, it's cool. I think you blew an engine as well that night as well, if I remember rightly. Yeah, I think I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they had to change, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember that because there's oil all over my new boots as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I think it was the the, the old Dick Bellamy Memorial Trophy that that race, and uh, I think it was a uh, if I remember rightly, because I've got I've got all the DVDs of that those meetings at, at home and uh, and things like that. And I remember you thinking saying it was a brand new engine you're trying out for next season, and you blew it up. I thought, oh great, <laughs> yeah, good plan on that, Paul. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's well tested that one. <laughs> yeah. But then obviously, and moving on to um, the long track grass track scene in '97, you managed to win a round of the World Long Track. GP series in Marmond, I think it was in 97 as well. So that must have been good for yourself, uh, lifting the confidence and everything on the long track. Yeah, that was another year that sort of things moved on. Um, <clears throat> and that, yeah, that was a quite a good good experience. So the, the world long track that year, I, I, had, I had a few problems. Um, I think the first round, I blew three engines up. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. I was just left with an old dog of a speedway engine to use. Um, and yeah, it's just experience, really. Um, but yeah, I went to my mond and I remember it because the, during the afternoon I went shopping with Steve Schofield, the, the old rider. Yeah. And I spent an absolute fortune in the Quicksilver shop. Oh no. I, thought, I sort of thought, shit, I need to have a good one tonight to pay for all this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, we had a good night and won that. And yeah, sort of things went on from there. Mm. Did you ever manage to make any of the uh, world finals in the, the long track, or was it just the Grand Prix you managed to get into? Yeah, no, I got into the last world long track final in '96. Um, and yeah, why well, the hell they're doing Grand Prix now? I don't know. Because <laughs> that occasion as a, for a world long track final mm. was definitely special. Yeah. Where was that in '96 then? Herxheimer. Herxheimer. Oh, I was in Germany, so yeah, it would have been a huge meeting then. Yeah, it so, was. Um, it was absolutely packed. And just the atmosphere and the, the people. Mm. It's just awesome. Yeah. And so when you when you when you look at a world long track now, mm. I mean they're lucky if they get eight hundred people there. Oh really? Is that bad? I, mean, I, just, I, I, don't, I don't really know how sort of how much it changes over the years, sort of thing with a long track. Yeah, it's gone from sort of chalk and cheese now. <laughs> It's just ridiculous. But yeah, I can't get into that one neither. No, get no. yourself in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're part of a board, aren't you? So you can't really say much. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i mean obviously uh with the obviously the, the long track grand prix and everything it, again it's like speedway it's varied from doing three rounds to six to i think one year was like 11 rounds something like that because i went to new zealand and things like that so but um how did you get on yourself in the grand prix did you prefer them to the one-off um probably not i i think with a, a one-off it's a it's a bigger occasion <clears throat> um and it it just spoils it. Oh, Speedway, I can get that. Yeah. It's cool. It's a it's a good show, and yeah, everything is is right for the Grand Prix Speedway. But for long track, it's never going to work as a Grand Prix. Mm. Um, it, it's not. You know, long track is a long track. It's different. There's a diff, different sort of strategy about it all. Mm. Um, and the television aren't interested in it because it's a boring. Yeah. So it's not. It's not. It's not right. No, no. It's unfortunate, isn't it? Really, because obviously, you know, if it, was, I think, if it was still a one-off final and things like that, you know, like you say, the crowds have been there, and then maybe even England might be able to have a, a have it over here, because obviously there is a few places where they have had long track meetings or long track meetings, where we say like eight hundred meter tracks and things like that. Not quite the thousands that you get in Germany mm. and places like that, but you know, you, I mean, have we got the facilities over here? Do you reckon to host that sort of thing over here? I don't know if we have for the like for a well thousand meter long track. Like a proper long track. Um, <clears throat> but in my opinion, they should have like a world long track final and a world grass track final. And if it was a world grass track final, yeah, we've, we've got a couple of venues mm. that could do that. 
Um, and I think if, if you've done that, you probably would get a few more of the speeder riders come and do it. Because at the moment, you've got probably, what, seven rounds with the semi-finals and the Grand Prix yeah. of long track that they'd have to miss riding in Poland. Where if they had a semi-final and a final, they'd have two meetings, which to be world champions is quite good for them. I suppose um, that, I suppose that like the FAM and, the, and other governing bodies would think like, like maybe the European final would be that sort of grass track type of type of final, really, compared to the, the world long track final. Mm. Yeah, they should. I, I, I mean, I keep banging my head against the wall with them, but they don't. <laughs> I think it's just it's financially and politically. Yeah, I, I think I think, keep doing. I think a lot of it's more political than financial sometimes. But yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. there we go. <laughs> but we'll keep stimming about that. Uh, <laughs> But obviously, then um, moving again, looking back to your Spiro career, um, you went you went to um, Oxford then for a couple of years in ninety eight and ninety nine. Um, again, was that sort of like a, a move that you wanted to do, come away from Kings Inn to go back to a smaller track, or was it just like easier for you to ride at Oxford? Um, I'm not really too sure why that happened. I don't know. I think because I was on loan to Kings Inn, mm. um, <clears throat> I think they they sort of changed the team around and. Steve Purchase, um, who went into Oxford, I knew him from, he used to sponsor Mark Seabright, who's Doyle's mechanic. Oh, yes. And Mark yeah. used to ride grass track. Um, so I knew the Purchase family before they actually got involved on Speedway. And obviously, when he went there, he then made sort of contact with us and was all interested in going there. And that's, yeah, that's when I moved there. Mm. Yeah, because I saw you when you had, um, I think, was Crumpy there as well that first year? You had Stepman, Scowie, and people like that there, weren't you, for the first year? Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. Um, and I think Todd coming later on. Mm. Um, but yeah, that no, was a good time as well. It was good times. Yeah, because that's also when you had the funny leathers or oh, race suits come in for that for that year and all the helmet colours and all that sort of thing, and the, the, ni- the nice sort of in- invention that sort of faded away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that the idea was to get everyone in team suits, but obviously the, that the like for stuff was a cheaper way of doing it. Um, but yeah, that no, was a good time, you know. It's it was different, um, yeah. and it was a good bunch of people there as well. And the fans were good there, and just to shame that's another one that's sort of gone to the wayside. Mm. Hopefully, you know, yeah. I think I think they're in the similar sort of boat to what Coventry really are, you know, the, the case of uh, wait and see, you know, and you got you've got some with deep pockets to go in there and sort of turn it all around, unfortunately. But uh, you never know, like you say, fingers crossed that could have sort of happened. But uh, what are your sort of memories of that sort those sort of time of Oxford? Do you have any good memories to, to like pinpoint? Yeah, that was great times. Mm. Um, yeah, like with Crumpy and a few of the other boys there, it was it was good. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, like they had a couple of test matches there as well that we we done. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, it was good. good. That's right. And I, I know it's hard sometimes to pick out a, a memory or remember anything much from these these times, but it is is kind of cool just to hear these sort of things. Like obviously, again, Crumpy, Scary, and people like that, all part of the grass track scene as well at the same time. So again, you're all full of you know how each other sort of rides. Yeah, no, it was good as well because obviously there was a couple of grass tracks down the road at Abingdon yeah. where I did, like the world. Long track Grand Prix there. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's all the history that went with Oxford as well, mm. with Simon Wig and Nielsen. And yeah, it was really, really good times. Yeah, buzzing atmosphere, I can imagine. Of course, <clears> yeah, definitely. The, with the purchases going in and turning that club around near enough and things like that, it must have been, again, a good atmosphere. And I've seen, again, 99, the TV got involved and Sky Sports and, and things like that. So, again, that's when Speedway was on its way up, I think, in, in, in history, sort of thing. Yeah, it was. And then obviously, it's a shame I don't do it now, James, but when the TV cameras went to the venues, everyone made a good effort and everything was presented right. You know, you had like the cheerleaders, all the white lines were painted white, the fences were clean, the, the pits were swept out um, and it was a proper show. But they seem to have forgotten about that nowadays. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was great times when that sort of come in and you just wish that the money that Sky had put in have been invested wisely. Yeah, but again, that's all ifs, ands and buts. You can't turn around and change what, what was been, unfortunately. But uh, like I say, yeah, because I think all the clubs in the Elite League were buzzing to have 
TV because obviously Speedway hadn't had proper TV probably since the the, the early nineties with the screen sport and things like that. You know, it was for the last real time that they had TV coverage. Um, and obviously, like you say, you could see. I mean, obviously, myself being an Eastbourne fan and things like that, you could see they pushed all the sponsors forward. They they had, uh, like I said, the start line people. You know, was all there, and the Razzmatazz was there, sort of thing again. Unfortunately, I think later on that's all sort of fizzled out, become a, per, a professional type of uh, environment now. Yeah, it is a shame that it's, it's all sort of gone. Um, and, you, yeah, it, it sort of it is a shame um, because at the end of the day, Speedway, it's racing, but it is a show. Yeah. Um, and some of the people seem to have forgotten about that. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it's just a shame. Yeah, again, he's got to be being careful what you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean because obviously you you kind of worn sort of both hats as again as a promoter, but on the grass track, and then obviously being an ex rider yourself and things like that. You know, so you kind of understand from both sides of the of the coin sort of thing nowadays. Yeah, it's different, um, and it's you can see where it, some places there's not an atmosphere, and that's what people want. I mean, yeah, you, I was only watching some. Last night, not before, where back in the day, sort of, you'd have a bit of a, a ruck with someone and people would just swarm in to see what was going on. Yeah. But obviously, nowadays, if you do that, you get like a 500 or 800 pound fine. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it's a show and people want to want to see that going on. Yeah. I mean, I can pinpoint that one from 2019 when it was Eastbourne, Glasgow. That, that, that was a night, <laughs> night and a half, I think. <laughs> yeah, but people, when they come back, you look at the crowd when they come back, mm. hopefully this year. Yeah. Because people want to see that. So what's going to happen next sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it, it adds to it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, um, I had Peter Oakes on before, and I mentioned the same story to him. And uh, he said, like, like anyone would say, that any news about Speedway would be good news, whether it's good or bad. You're still going to make the papers and things like that. I mean, unfortunately, you look at the Martin Dugard incident with Stefan Anderson, that made headline pages back then and things like that in national newspapers. But it was it was good for Speedway, even though it was wrong for Speedway at the same time. Yeah, and I bet the next time King's Inn went there, there was probably a bigger crowd than what they would have got. Well, it probably was. I can't remember so long ago. <laughs> and it's you know it's it's what it is. It's just it's an opportunity that's missed. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. That doesn't seem to like jump on the bag my bandwagon with it and sort of like blow it up bigger than what it should be just to get people interested. Yeah, mate. It's just a show, isn't it? At the end of that, it's entertainment, and it's what we're lacking. <laughs> yeah, exactly, hundred percent. But I have got some footage from '98. Um, again, it's to do with um, Brighton. Um, this one is one I want to talk about because I think it was uh, that, 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 that dreaded final that uh, you, you kind of, we had about eight reruns from it um, and uh, it kind of you know you kind of blew it I think it was in the, in the, in the final you I'll know. never forget that one <laughs> yeah uh, I've just got it here I'll just bake the screen a bit for the um, I've got all I've got the whole the whole thing so it's all the reruns as well so if you want to sort of like talk a sort of three-way little bit of it you know things like that from what you can remember um obviously you're on gate three in this one um and stuff like that but it was a long it was a long old final in the end <laughs> yeah i remember it because it i'm not too sure i think um i don't know what i've done the day before but i was absolutely sh- i think i rode in a trials meeting the day before and i shouldn't have done <laughs> oh, i was right. absolutely shattered mm. and the final kept going on and yeah things kept happening and yeah, well, I kept that, getting in front, and then it, it was just lack of concentration in the last one. Yeah, and I mean, let's say this is the first stage of it when Screeny got pushed a little bit wide by Martin, you know, and things like that. But obviously, that, that was the first time they changed the shape of the track as well. So it was like that, that sort of like kidney sort of shape as well. So Yeah, we had the big turn back. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And obviously, with you saying earlier about you learning how to park it and things like that, that must have suited you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what was a good brand there, because I just... <laughs> I park everywhere now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is the second rerun. I think this is one where um, uh, Brent touches the tapes and goes off ten yards, or you know, cause you couldn't do fifteen meters at Brian because you'd be off around the third, third and fourth. Exactly, bend, and that's was that the first time that they put the start at an angle as well. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, so gate four had a bit of an advantage. Uh, yeah, the inside because obviously you know if you have it, had it parallel at Brian, you're going to get shoved out on gate four and things like that. But. Uh, yeah, so this is when obviously Brent goes back again on the, on the handicap and things like that. 
But um, obviously, Brighton was a great time because uh, it was it was good fun. You know, like I say, Christmas time. It was a good meet and greet and things like that as well. I mean, look at you can see the, some of the crowd there already. You know, and stuff like that. It was obviously good. It was, and like everyone, obviously, just after or just before Christmas, everyone's sort of in that sort of joyful mood. And but yeah, you, went no, so, just you probably weren't so joyful when the old uh, helmet came on, though. You know, you wanted the win. <laughs> yeah, not there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, you did. And it's obviously, whenever you put your helmet on, you want to win and do the best you can. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah. yeah, it's what it is, isn't it? You just try and do your best and enjoy riding your bike. And Yeah. We've actually with, seen this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with your mates sort of thing, you know, and stuff like that. But um, obviously, again, yeah. obviously, uh, I think Screeny falls again. Yeah, Screeny falls again here. You know, and, and uh, <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, he gets up so quickly, you could have carried on. But... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, that's a shame because Martin was, I don't think I'd have caught Martin that, that time. No, I don't think um, I would have um, no. um, And of course, Martin was riding upright in this meeting this time. He was on the old Godden, I think it was. And uh, yeah, so, you know, but yeah, yeah, obviously, like they say, Christmas time, that sort of thing. And of course, Adam, like I say, likes a screeny doing it. He had Mark do it at some like, a few times. And I like say Martin and things like that. It was good to have, have those sort of guys around. You were all entertainers at that time as well and all sort of grew up together as well. Exactly. That's it. We're all best of mates. And even to this day, we all sort of still chat and have yeah. a laugh and a joke. Um, Apart from when screen does oh. that. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's, it's it's just about having fun, isn't it, really? Yeah, um, it, it is, yeah. But obviously, it's a serious as well because you want to win. You know, you want to have another... Another win, you know, obviously, like I say, you won it in 97. You want to try and retain it if you can and that sort of thing. But obviously, after, I think, 99, they went to the old um, car tyres, didn't they? So they uh, the whole keep the track together more than anything. Yeah, yeah that's a bit different, obviously, because trying to get them off the start and sort of get them to a cut was totally different. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know if I, I don't know if I won with them or not. I can't remember. Um, I think you might have, well, I think you might have done. Well, done it once, I think it was, but then that was obviously when the likes of Eddie and people like that were coming through and starting to, to do well in these sort of meetings. But yeah, this is like yeah. another rerun. This time you managed to get across my line. Across my line, yeah. <laughs> and I still balls up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't this one he didn't balls up in, it was the next one he balls up in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the easier one. Yeah, the easier one. But, uh, yeah, and then Martin, I've always got a bit of a tank slap. <laughs> You know, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously, say this Christmas time event, say, same with Telford and things like that, you know, obviously, were, which you managed to win as well, Telford. And, you know, again, just a fun atmosphere, I can imagine. Yeah, it was. It's fun and just laid back and just, yeah, just enjoy riding your bike, really. Yeah. Um, I know Telford was totally different to sort of what I expected. Mm. Um, yeah, no, it's just a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Again, we reiterate that it's, it's the fun of Speedway. We, we it's unfortunately can't get these sort of meetings at the moment again, you know. But uh, maybe one day we can get these sort of indoor meetings, these fun events back. Because obviously, the old days it used to be like I said, Burn Up November, Brighton, and then Telford, and then obviously Newport Classic. Yeah, that's it. And it's it's those sort of meetings that we're that sort of yeah we're missing now. Um, um, and even sort of through the season when we used to have like the twelve lap at Lakeside, the sixteen lap for Ipswich. Um. You know, they were great times and you used to be able to enjoy yourself and have a laugh and a joke with your mates and, yeah. yeah enjoy yourself, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wait for this crash. <laughs> One rookie mistake, wasn't it? I, mean, I just picked it up up there. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. But you know, it's just one of those. It's one of those things. It's one of the things that I remember as a kid that sticks out in my mind whenever I think of sort of sort of Brighton or indoors. That that one that you got away from you. <laughs> you know, really. Yeah. yeah, typical lack of concentration. That was. Yeah, definitely. yeah. yeah. I think I was more um, looking behind than anything else. You know, see yeah. how, how far Brent was behind you. <laughs> Never look behind. It's as I tell kids now, don't look behind. You know, that's the reason why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got this bit of footage. It shows you why. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, but uh, nah, that's just one of those things. But well, say, <laughs> yeah, well, shouldn't away you went, but kept the bike running and kept going. That's the main thing. <laughs> just two, but yeah, yeah. Didn't have a big enough lead. No, no. Well, you don't. You don't get much of a big enough lead around Brighton, unfortunately. But, <laughs> but yeah, obviously, like I say that that, that that was good times, and obviously, then uh, moving into the millennium, uh, you signed for Eastbourne um, again, won the league championship with Eastbourne. Obviously, um, 
I remember a lot of good things happened that year. Obviously, you know, Martin win the British Grand Prix um, and things like that, and a whole different turnaround at the club. So obviously, finishing near, near bottom in '99, signing yourself and Screeny and um, Petri Coco must have been a, a it was a huge turnaround. But um, was that sort of a move that you wanted to do in your career? Was come somewhere like Eastbourne? Um, yeah, because obviously being friends with Dino Martin um, and everyone there um, beforehand. Mm. Um, yeah, I wanted to ride there. And it's, it's strange because I was actually working at the track before I even signed for him. All right. Um, yeah, and I, was, I think I was, work, I was working at the track in 97 as well, mm. that winter. Um, so it's quite strange because he was digging up the track to go and lay the Brighton track. Oh, right, um, I see. So I was always amongst everyone. And then sort of that 2000 year, it was sort of a nice relief to be sort of going to a club that I was at working and knew everyone and, yeah, no, it was, it was a great time. Yeah, you literally knew everyone inside out, you know, you knew how everything was operated and the way you went sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, like obviously Darren, Darren Roy Proger. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it was cool. And obviously everyone in the team we knew. Um, yeah. And we were all best of mates and we had a right laugh. Yeah, which obviously, then, obviously, like I said, it went on to the results. You know, you can see that the results and how how the team done things like that. But obviously, that year, also, you managed to think, finish uh, third in the British final, was it that year? Your highest result in the British final? Second. Second, was it? Oh, second. Yeah, I was oh, second. Because right. I'll never forget, because I was in heat one, I don't know if I was in heat one, one of the earlier heats, and I was off a of gate one. Mm. And Stoney was off a of two, and Chris was off a of three. Yeah. And they just clamped me down. And I sort of, yeah, I'm kicking myself now because I've, it's only race for drop that night. Yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously Chris went on to win with a 15 point maximum and I got 13. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, because uh, I think, because obviously Martin was third, I think that night as well. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I was trying to think. I think it was, you came second or was it Martin? I couldn't remember which way round it was, but. Uh, it was uh, quite cool because obviously we're riding together and then we went through all the sort of rounds together. Mm. Sort of the, I'll come on my off into continental. And then we got to the, I think, I don't think it was. Was it a challenge or something before the yeah. Grand Prix? Yeah, it would have been the challenge. Yeah. Mm. We were there together, so it was, it was really cool. Yeah, and obviously trying to get to that, get to the Grand Prix and things like that. You know, it must have been you know interesting road for yourself to to experience. Yeah, it was, and obviously I was trying to sort of get in there. Mm. And Martin was to lay back about things. It was sort of quite a good weight or calming weight for me as well. Sort of being around Martin and yeah, just being chilled really. And yeah, obviously, exactly. where he's been there, seen and done it beforehand, it, it was a sort of great help. Mm. Yeah, because it sort of like guides you sort of a little bit way through. Because whereas Martin was sort of winding down from his career, sort of things. So I think after that time, he just won the British Grand Prix, you know, and then everyone expected him to make the Grand Prix and things like that, but he never did, unfortunately. But um, you know, was that sort of like ever an ambition for yourself to try and get in, in as a wild card, maybe to a British Grand Prix, or you know, even get into the full time series? Yeah, there was a couple of sort of years I really wanted to go for it. Um, <clears throat> and I think it was twice I'd sort of got to the meeting before getting into the Grand Prix. Um, I think one of them was 2001 or two. Mm. When it was, I think the challenge was in Checo. And I think it was when, I don't know if it was Nicky or Ronnie Petson qualified. And Peter Colson. Yeah. Um, I was leading my first race and the chain came off. And then I, was, I think it was a second and a win. And I was leading the fourth ride and my chain come off. So without those, if I'd have had those two, I might have been in the Grand Prix. But yeah. it's all boxing this. Yeah, but also that was the time when you had the uh, knockout system as well, wasn't it? So you had the, your two rides and went home. So I think even in the Grand Prix Challenge, you had two rides and went home yeah. if you weren't careful yeah. and things like that. So, you yeah, know. Yeah, no, it's definitely tough. Yeah, it's tough. tough. Yeah. Yeah, everyone says it was tough in my day. You know, you think it's tough. Yeah, now? <laughs> yeah it was. When you think back, it yeah, it, it, it's probably just as tough now, though. To be fair, mm. if not tougher. Yeah, especially when you've got a couple of poles just chasing you down and things like that nowadays. <laughs> yeah, and obviously, like for us, then we used to have sort of rounds over here and mm. France, or not France, but like Germany or whatever. But obviously now it's sort of mainly Poland and and all that, so they've got to yeah. travel. Yeah, I've also got a bit of footage from that season uh, with Eastbourne. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's against Paul when with you and Martin at uh, at, at number one and two. Um, I think this was actually quite quite a good ride for yourself. Um, yeah, so just to sort of like show to everyone that how much you were sort of like enjoying your speedway and things like that, and obviously the partnership with Martin must have been good. 
It was, and it was always sort of, it was weird because where sort of Martin was so dominant, you'd always sort of try and get to him, mm. but you knew you weren't going to beat him. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and yeah, like it, it was just fun. You know, it was never stressful or sort of, yeah, no, it was never hard work. Mm. And he was always having, like, even sort of doing this, we would be having fun and laughing and joking when we got back in and yeah, try and see just if it was, rolled like that, really. Trying to see if you go slowest sort of thing into the corner. <laughs> yeah, like it that. was. It was just, and then sometimes you would do this and you'd, you'd pull away from it. Yeah. And it was just, yeah, it's a sort of natural, I suppose, or cool. Yeah. yeah, and also not being too far away from your base probably then as well and things like that. So you could obviously get back to the grass track and your long track in, on the Sunday sort of thing. Yeah, it was. It was quite good really because I used to come home, unload and load up and then go straight to Dover and go on the continent. Um, but yeah, no, it was good times, yeah. Yeah, it was good times. I mean, it was great because obviously, like I said, you know, won the league, you can't be much better than that. And obviously then in 2001, you went to Wolverhampton. So it was a bit of a change. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was. I didn't really want to move, um, but obviously they lowered the points limit. Obviously, we had quite high points limit at the time. Mm. Um, and yeah, I didn't really want to go, but it's what happens, isn't it? When you're sort of a lonely rider, they want to keep your own assets, which is understandable. And you had to go to Wolverhampton. So, who owned your contract at that time? Then? Was it Oxford who owned you then? Um, I think it was still Terry and Ivan. Oh, was it? Okay. I think it was Terry and Ivan, and I owned Arf myself. So. Mm. Yeah, I could sort of have a, a bit of a say so where I wanted to go. Because mm. also with uh, probably like Arena it being sort of like the lower league at that time as well, I the first two were still sort of part of that sort of uh, corporation still. He gave you that sort of, like I say, that leeway to say, well, actually I want to go here rather than go there sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, like, yeah, obviously they owned me and they give me the sort of, not free run, but they sort of said, well, where do you want to go? Mm. And it, yeah, it's a nice setup. Yeah, and obviously then you spent two seasons at Wolverhampton, so again, a small track, but then again, success happened in 2002 where you managed to, to beat Eastbourne in the playoffs for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> good job, a good first first playoff, because the second playoff, I was an absolutely nightmare at Eastbourne. I, I know, um, I, think, I think you only did three rides, you didn't score one, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I was just, obviously, riding there and being amongst all my mates again, Yeah, um, you sort of feel the pressure, and that night was a nightmare. Um yeah. But yeah, no, it was it was good times, and obviously that's where I sort of met Peter and Michael Carlson. Mm. I'm gone, knock house on fire, um, yeah. and yeah, another cool year really. Um, and at the end of that year, during I think it might have been 2001, mm. we or Terry asked us to go noise testing at Sitting Bull. Okay. Me and Floppy, mm. David Noise. Um, so there was a chance that Terry and Ivan were going to Sitting Bull. Um, and in 2002, Wolverhampton wanted to buy me. Um, obviously, I was a little bit dubious, thinking I don't want to be travelling from Kent to Wolverhampton when I could be going from Kent to City Ball mm. every Monday or whatever it was. Um, so I sort of stalled them a little bit. And then, yeah, after that, they sort of signed, I think they signed Daniel Newmark instead. Um, and that was that. I went on to Ipswich after that. Yeah, because I think I remember say, I remember reading at that time that uh, Ivan and Terry were going at, at I weighed um, at the time because I think Mark was on the books there as well to go there. Um, yourself, Mark, and then maybe a few others were there. But then obviously, I think it came to like February or sort of time, they, they didn't get their license to do it. Um, so consequently, then it left yourself and several other riders scrambling for team places. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I think that, that was probably the time that we, we all ended up at Lakeside as well. Mm. There was, I think there was me, Mark, Dino, Avi. I think that might have been 2004 or five. Yeah, that was 2004, I think it was, because uh, yeah. I think in 2003, that's when Terry Russell went into Eastbourne uh, it, yeah. and things like that. As well, so when, like I said, when you were at Ipswich and things like that. But Ipswich wasn't really a, a good year for member right for yourself. I think you, um, did you get hurt in that year? Or yeah, I was right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think no, it was a diff- different year. I'm, Ipswich wasn't always a favourite track of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I sort of went there hoping to turn things around and, and sort of sort things out. Um but at the time, I, I changed engine tuners and frames and everything, and it, it sort of took its time to get going again. And then it was when we were doing the – we sort of had the top league, and then we had that sort of – whatever league it was, where you sort of – you had a, a, a B team riding against sort of the lower league. Yeah, that, that was the, the British League Cup 
that's thing it. They, they had then, yeah. Yeah. And so I was doing quite well in that. But then when I went into Elite League, um, I was still a heat leader, but I was struggling. Um, so things went a little bit belly up. And then, I, yeah, I went to Bellevue when I shouldn't have done because I wasn't very well. I flew and dosed myself up. And I think I was racing Jason Crump. And where I was just a bit dopey, I went into the corner, it picked up, and I went just went straight through the fence. Oh, right. Um, well, I, I went under the fence, mm. and the bike went over the top and landed on me and you know, snapped oh. the arm. Out, so. Oh, right. Yeah. So where about the arm did you break then? Was it above the elbow? Was yeah, it yeah just at the top. Yeah, yeah, just above the elbow. Yeah, and of course, then, so that's what we've had. I think you've had problems with that ever since sort of thing, haven't you, really? Yeah. Um, I broke it six times after that oh. because it never sort of fully healed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it stemmed from when I had that accident. Um, I wait, I'd done it on the Monday and I got sent, I waited to come back to Kent to a private hospital on the Wednesday. Mm. And they never operated on me till the following Monday. Okay. Um, in the meantime, some of the bone sort of started to die. Mm. Um, and it splintered and the bits that splintered, the, the surgeon took out and he just put a rod down the centre of it. Well, obviously mm. the gap was too big to bridge across. Um so things just went a little bit AWOL from there, really. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I remember seeing, I think you um, uh, a grass shot one time. You had a cage around it from I think you broke it before. You had a cage it, around yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, whatever time you broke that, I mean, what number that was. I don't <laughs> know, but but um, I remember seeing that at, uh, at Frittenden, I think it was. You were doing your clock on course something like that, and so, bloody hell, well, he's, he has really broken his arm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it was basically what it was. It where it wouldn't heal properly. Mm. Um, the guy that I went and sees one of our top non-union bone specialists. Mm. Um, so we shaved the bone back to fresh bone and put the cage on it which pulled it together oh yeah yeah so like every three days you'd have to adjust it to stretch the bone um, yeah it's done its job so it's, it's it's good now oh that's good then obviously yeah touch wood <laughs> but obviously um, obviously that, that was obviously the year of struggle and obviously then you went back to, to Lakeside slash Arena Essex in 2004 which you stayed there for a few more seasons really yeah and it it, it was a bit of a home sort of, yeah, coming home, really. Um, mm. I felt comfortable, but I should have taken a year out then and got the arm fully healed and, and strong enough because it probably for about four or five years after that, or four years, um, yeah. it just kept giving me problems. And it never healed properly, then it wasn't strong enough, and then I'd break it again, and it was just, yeah, disaster after disaster. Um, but, yeah, after that, in 2010, when I had the, the big crash, um, I finally got it sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just a few years after that, you know. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, yeah, I, can, on. I, can, I can imagine that it, like every sort of full slide off was like, oh crap, my arm, my arm sort of thing, you know, that maybe that sort of thing. Yeah, there was a couple of times I was in Germany and um, we was on a thousand meters track in Ludenhausen mm. and the belt broke and I didn't have enough strength to stop myself hanging out the handlebars. Yeah. And obviously, I was going quite quick and I was just gone over the handlebars, but I've sort of tucked in, just oh. tucked my arm in. And it just, so it probably saved me, if anything, as yeah. well. So, yeah, yeah so it's just what it is. Sometimes thinking about it does some, tend to help sometimes, you know, things like yeah, that. Yeah, you just got to relax and go to fly. About a crash, but yeah, just <laughs> chill out. <laughs> yeah, relax, it's fine, you bounce. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly but obviously it didn't really deter you from doing your grass track and your long track like you just said and things like that so obviously that was still thriving you're still going strong in that yeah it's sort of second nature to me now that's what I've done mm -hmm. since I was five or six years old um, so yeah I just find that not easier to ride because it is a lot harder to ride than speedway but I just feel at home on the grass track bike than what I do a speedway bike mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, did you ever think that um, it was going to stop you then, this arm injury then, completely? Like, you're going to say, right, that's it, one more break, I'm done, sort of thing? Um, I would never have said it. I wouldn't have stopped. Someone, a doctor or someone would have said, you, well, they did. Mm. You can't ride. Um, I did take 2008 out, and it, it was quite bad. Um, and one of the surgeons said, then, if you break it again, Paul, we, we don't know what we're going to do. And it might come to sort of having to take it off. Um, but yeah, it's what it is, isn't it? You just, you could walk out the front door and get run down by a bus. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's no, no different to get, like I say, fall off a speedway bike or 
crashing in a car. You know, you could have done the same yeah. injury again and again and again somewhere else, sort of thing. Exactly. I mean, I've gone, yeah, it's from sort of 1985 until then, sort of broke it. So, yeah, you don't know, do you? You don't know okay. what's around the corner. You still had a good run, though, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that one's too bad. No, exactly. But also, it, um, in 2005, you managed to finally win the Bonfire Burnout. Um, yeah. after, after many years of trying, I've got I've got the final here, um, which I can share you from Bob's videos <coughs> on his YouTube channel. I thought I'd bring this one up because it's one of um, your sort of like um, big achievements, I think, in in British grass track anyway, and things like that was to, was to win um, the burn up. Because obviously, like I said, you've had many many years of trying, and on this very very dry day at Collier Street, <laughs> you know what? I just wanted to get that day out of the way because yeah. we. Um, me and a few mates were going trialling in Cornwall the very next morning. Oh, right. And um, I was just like, I need to get this over and done with. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, 2005 was quite good on the grass track for me that year. Um, I think I won, oh, yeah, I did, I won the European, the Masters, I think I was third in the Grand Prix as well. Yeah, you were, yeah. yeah so it was an all-round good year then on the grass. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. Um, but this was it's just one of those days, it was tricky, you just had to sort of survive, really. Yeah, well, yeah, survive um, the fittest, you know. It's what Grash all about, isn't it? Getting stuck in the Exactly. <laughs> exactly, you just got yeah, drop the clutch, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then sort of go from there. I remember being there that day, because I think it was like the first time I'd gone back to proper grass at Collier Street that year as well, because obviously they had the, the speedway track in there for quite a while, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, no, it was definitely different. I didn't make a very good start, and even... I think Cut Theo did it for quite a while. Oh. Yeah. Cut the corner and, uh, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just one of those days where you, oh, where you just have to um, do your best you can and keep playing on. Yeah. Just start on board if you can. Yeah, exactly. Which I think, uh, uh, I, think I don't think Theo did in the end. But yeah, it is, I say, it's a tricky condition. But it's a shame that we don't have College Street no more because obviously it was one of the, the prime venues in, in, in British Grass Track. Yeah, no, it was good. Um, brilliant race track. Um, and when Tom and John Penfold had it, you, it was brilliant meetings. Mm. And you've only got to look at the bonfire burn up up till about 2003, I think it was. Mm. Um, they were first class, and yeah, like as a kid, I used to go there when sort of you see Wiggy and Schofield and Donkey, mm. all those riders there. Mm. It was brilliant days, and it's a shame that we don't have the sort of the ace of aces and the burn up nowadays. I'd say the Ace of Aces again was another classic one because that was obviously a track which was in the valley, you know, that sort of thing, down one corner, up the other side, and the exactly. way went sort of thing. But uh, yeah. it is a shame we don't have those sort of meetings now because, again, they were the internationals of, of the grass track and long track world, weren't they, back then? Yeah, no, they were. Um, I'm not so sure whether we'd have the, the sort of calibre of riders nowadays that would do their meetings. Um, you don't get the, there you go, yeah. you don't get the, <laughs> the, the sort of characters now, you know. Yeah. Um, no disrespect to him. There's you've got Zach Walsh next. He's a good little lad. Yeah. Um, but the rest of them, they've got no sort of charisma about them. Mm. And it's very, it's difficult nowadays to to get those riders. Yeah, I mean, but I think I think a lot of the time the the, the British riders are, are are pretty well off because obviously you got to say like Zach, you have got James, um, Eddie, you know, people like that who are sort of. Um, up there with the best of them, I think, really, you know, more mm. than anything. Um, it's a shame, shame, obviously, then you had, um, again, Eric Riss, who doesn't do it no more, doesn't do the long track, but, you know, again, the Riss name would have been great to, to have as in, at international meetings. Yeah, no, it would be. Um, but it's it's just, it's difficult, isn't it? It's, people have got different things to do nowadays. Um, and obviously, trying to get that calibre of rider there, um by all means, like if we had to fund him, we'd want to get Bartos there, we'd want to get Ty there, we'd want to get Robert Lambert there. Um, but you can't because they're, they're in Poland earning what they earn. Yeah, too much money um, in Poland. <laughs> yeah, so it, I mean, that's ideally I'd like to take the club on from my dad and do that, but funding it to do that, it's, it's not achievable. And, yeah, you, you could offer them so much money, but I'm still pretty sure that they wouldn't come for that um, because it's just the inconvenience of getting the grass that bike and coming over the side of the water. Yeah, yeah, just basically riding in the field, you know, for, yeah. for, for the day sort of thing. But uh, Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Ty would because he's yeah. that type of bloke. He, he's interested and he's a, he's a good bloke. 
I'm sure Robert would. Um, but it's it's just getting the finances to, and you, you can't fault them for, for saying, oh, yeah, I want X next, because that's what they're worth. You know, they've, they've got their self in that position through damn hard work mm. and putting in the hours and everything. Mm. And that's that's their job. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I understand where they're coming from, but it's, it's just difficult sort of for grass track at the moment. Is it hard then to try to like raise funds to get from sponsorship then sort of that sort of thing and to, to help with these meetings then? Um, it is really obviously nowadays with the sort of what we're going through. Yeah. People haven't got that sort of money to throw about. Um, and obviously with grass track, it's not televised. Mm. Um, we have done it in the past where we've paid TV companies to come and televise it for sort of the lesser channels like Motors TV and that. Yeah. Um but again, you, if you're paying for that, you're not paying for the. You can't afford to do both because mm. it is quite dear to put on the meeting. So you've got to cover your costs and then pay for that. It's it's difficult. Yeah, you can't really sort of make money out of it at all, really, as a, as a promoter. Whereas you could have probably made it like we say when your dad was riding and people place the time like that. It was a different time again. Yeah, you know, um, less sort of less sort of if things are on like there is nowadays. Because people went to these sort of events, and not just saying it's necessarily speedway or grass track, but they went to more motor events. I think you know you had um, like your stuff like Lyndon Circuit and stuff like that. We had huge crowds of that sort of thing. We don't get that nowadays. No, and I've, again, like I was only talking to my dad this morning mm. um, about what we're going to do with with the grass track club, and he was saying back then, like when they used to run at Lyndon, mm. obviously they had grass track there. Um, he said you had people like Ollie Olsen, Ivan Major, Barry Briggs, and all the top speed riders come and done it. Well, obviously you're going to get a crowd then. Obviously nowadays you, you can't can't do that. No, no but then the difference was that they weren't riding in Poland, Sweden, Denmark, exactly. and the Grand Prix series and everything else. I mean, again, I think it, I think it's a time where uh, that sort of is gone. We've got to sort of adapt with what we've got, but then what we've got isn't right for everybody sort of thing as well so it's a, it's a double-edged sword really unfortunately it, it does revert back to the BSBA yeah <laughs> because oh, no. <laughs> back then back then you know England was the place everyone wanted to ride mm. now it's not no, Poland is and Sweden is it, mm. it, it, it's yeah, yeah. Things changed. Unfortunately, great. And unfortunately, England at the moment has lost out to a lot of things. But maybe after this pandemic and we get ourselves back on our feet, maybe this, there might be a turning point somewhere. But not necessarily saying it'd be this year, next year. It might be again two, three years down the line. So maybe it could turn around. I think it will turn around when there's an independent person running the BSBO. That's yeah. the only time it's going to turn around. Yeah, good though. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of come off that one. That, that's, that's a chat for not when we were recording, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but again, looking at your own career, um, obviously, say, say 2008, you took, took that season out to try and heal the arm as much as you could and things like that. Um, but in 2009, you went to Paul and had a bit of a tryout with Paul and things like that. You know, again, it must have been good to be around people like Matt Ford, <laughs> Midlow, um, who else would have been there? So like Pedersen, Limbach, what was that at the time? Yeah, yeah, that was good. Um it's a bit out of the blue, really, because um, obviously I took 2008 out. Mm. Um, and obviously when you do that, you're not on the sort of radar for anyone. Yeah. Um, so I started practising and sort of doing a few grass tracks and, and whatnot. Um, and obviously I'm like, yeah, best mates with Joe Screen. Mm. And obviously he was at Paul. Oh, yeah. Um, and then obviously he mentioned to Midlow, they were starting to struggle a little bit. Why don't you give me a go? Um, so I wasn't really prepared for it. Um, well, I didn't really have decent enough kit, really. Um, and I remember getting a phone call to come down and have a practice, and you can, I think it's practice in the afternoon and ride in the evening. Yeah. Um, and I had one bike that I'd had from sort of two years previous. Um, I took that down and they provided me with a, another one. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of give it a go. Um, but I was only there on a sort of temporary basis. I think mm. it was until one of them come back. I'm not too sure it was. Yeah. Um, but then we got to that point when they were fit to come back um, and I sort of started to go all right and the average mm. had gone up a little bit well then they couldn't fit me in and him in yeah. though obviously he was one of their assets and I had to make way and then I think they put Paul Fry in mm. I think there was only a couple of meetings that they needed to and then from there I went to Swindon so 
yeah, and again, a big a big track probably suited you a little bit, you know, just to sort of relax and get yourself back into the speedway. It was, yeah, it was good. Um, obviously, going back to ride for Terry as well, yeah, and being with sort of Lee Adams and Matty Zagar and, and Steady it was good. Mm. Um, but again, where I hadn't sort of invested at the start of the season, it was very hard to sort of get me equipment to what yeah. I needed because I'd start move from one track to another, then you start the ball rolling again, and you've got. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it was all right. I enjoyed it and probably didn't get the results that I wanted, but mm. at the end of the day, I was sort of back in the game and enjoying myself. Yeah, that's the main thing, as long as you're enjoying yourself, you know, and the way you went sort of thing. But then you obviously went back to Lakeside again in 2010, you know, and had another season there. Again, a, a track obviously you knew inside out, shall we say. You know, it's just like you never went away from the place, really. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's, it was always home, you know. Um, obviously, right back to when... I started riding Speedway in 87. I used to go there during the winters and practice when they were practicing there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was sort of a, nat- a natural thing for me to do. No. Um, obviously signing there when I was 16 with Terry and Ivan. And then obviously, yeah, it sort of got moved on and I think Ronnie was running it. Or oh, Cookie had gone in there. I can't remember. I think, I think it was, was it Stuart Douglas and yeah. Cookie and, and, Ron- yeah. and Ronnie and things like that? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's sort of a, a thing that I wanted to do and sort of going home. Yeah, exactly. But then obviously, didn't you take a few years out from Speedway and just concentrate on the grass track and long track then after that? Well, in in 2010, I'd, I was going right for like, so then I broke both my legs and dislocated my knees. <laughs> right. Um, so then that that put me out and in a wheelchair for six months, I think I was. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why I, I was, I wouldn't have stopped. Oh, I'd I'd carry on going. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I had five years, was it five or six years out? Six years, I think. Yeah. Um, and I had no intentions of riding. That was it. That was going to be it. I was sort of a mechanic for Adam Shields and then Pietro Swedowski and then back with PK. Um, so I was happy. Yeah. Um, and then there was a local grass track and one of my sponsors said, well, why don't you have a go now that you can sort of walk properly? Um, <laughs> so I went out a, a bit of a go round and I thought, yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, I think I finished second. I think Georgie would beat me on that day. Mm. Um, I just got the bug for it again, and that was it. Away I went again. Yeah. Was that riding on the, on the 250 or the 350 rather than the 500s? Then were you just coming back into it slowly then? No, I was on the 500. It was on the 500, was it? Okay. Yeah, I, had, I just had one bike that I kept because obviously I destroyed the other one when I crashed. Um, mm. And yeah, I sort of had that bike with a speedway engine in, so it wasn't really. That great bike, and I did quite a good result, and it sort of got you back into it. That gave me more hunger because I'm thinking, well, I've just rode that old shitter and finished that, <laughs> and I can might be all right. You managed to mix it again. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. That it, obviously coming back from what I'd done, mm. um, I had some sort of idea that I'd ride again, but I didn't know when and where. Yeah. Um, so just making that decision, and then when I did, I was like, yeah, this is. I, I'm, I enjoyed that. I'm back. You're back. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There was a couple of times in 2012, I think I went down to Eastbourne in the winter and practiced mm. on one of the speedway bikes that I still had at the time. But I could hardly walk properly, let alone ride a speedway bike. <laughs> um, and it hurt. So I, yeah. I stopped. And that was when I thought, well, there might be a day that I ride again, but I didn't mm. know when. Yeah, and then obviously then, like I said, you were throwing spanners for several riders at uh, Arena. Um, I said, notably with PK mainly, I think, was uh, most of the time, because obviously when he was there, you were there mechanicing for him. Yeah, no, it was good, because he, yeah, I had everything here. Um, yeah. The van, the bikes, everything. He just flew in, picked them up, and we went and done a speed room meeting, and we'd come back here and do whatever, and it was a bull, and it's probably that that sort of made me sort of want to ride speedway again, really. Mm. Um, just seeing the way that PK done things and how laid back it is and how easy it can be. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, there's nothing better. So PK was good to work for then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't wish for a nicer bloke, even off the track, you know, there's no drama and, mm. yeah, we got to knock out some far. And even to, like, yesterday I spoke to him about I thought I was talking to him about lorries or something. <laughs> and no, we, we just mates. Yeah, we just, yeah. we often sort of phone each other and see what each other's doing and have a laugh and a joke and away we go. 
Yeah, that's cool. That's cool that you managed to keep in contact with a lot of the uh, the, the boys and things like that. Because obviously, like you yeah. said, you, know, you rode against PK for so long, and then you mechanic for PK. You know, it must have been a weird thing to be. <laughs> yeah, it was like being his mechanic, and but it was never. You know, you like you see some riders they don't give their mechanics the respect. Yeah, but with PK, I you know I've respected him highly because of what he's achieved mm. and who he is. Um, but it, he give it back as well. And he would say, what do you think? And I'm like, well, you're Pete Colson, I don't know. <laughs> but it, you know, it's it was neutral and it was, it was cool. Yeah, I think also having a, an ex-rider again in your camp who sort of knows and understands how to ride a bike, you know, and, and you've both ridden at the same level, you know, you can sort of say, well, yeah, maybe this, maybe that, but then it felt like this, you know, yeah, it's consequently great communication between mechanic and rider. Yeah, and it, like, most people used to think we used to make 100 changes a night. But we might only change a jet or a tooth on the sprocket, and that was it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it was enjoyable and it was a good experience. Yeah. Because so obviously, then you went on to help uh, people like Zach on the, on the grass track and things like that, and sort of helped his career go forward to win the Masters and do well in Europe and things like that. So, that must have given you some good satisfaction as well in recent years. Yeah, obviously, with Zach, um, I've known him since he was 11, um, or helped him since he was 11. Um, the year after I broke my legs, the ACU said, well, would you, because you're not riding, would you help the, the kids? Mm. Um, so I went to, I think it was part of, was it part of the beats? Yeah, it was. Um, I think it was Carl Bickley and, and Zach. So we helped him to. Um, and I got on really well with Zach and I knew his dad from previous, sort of back in the day when he used to raise Kevin. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was it. It was just a, a joy to help him and, and see him progress to what he is now. It was, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, because obviously um, he came through, let's say, the way that you pretty much came through, um, through Speedway as well and things like that. So I remember seeing him on the on the 125, I think it was, doing the, uh, the youth rounds at Eastbourne and things like that, thinking, this kid's got something good for him. Never even heard of him before, sort of thing. And come on to do see one meeting, you think, shit, he's going to be good in a year or two, maybe. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, he's a, he is, you know, he's, he's not a natural, mm. but he works hard at what he does. Um and it's just a shame that he, he's gone down that path now with just doing grass track and long track because of the pressure got too much for speedway. Mm. Um, and it's it's another thing that the BSPA could help out with. You know, they could relieve relieve the pressure on on the youngsters or help them protect them a little bit. Because yeah, um, I because I was at um, Bellevue, I think in was it 2019, uh, 2019 or twenty eighteen? I said, well, I helped James Shane's out, and Zach was at reserve with with James, and you could see that um, Swindon wanted them in the team, but they both weren't at that level yet, and things like that. And I think the pressure got onto Zach because James wasn't performing. I think it was vice versa as well with James, yeah. um, and things like that. But yeah, I, I completely understand that you put too much pressure on these kids too early; they're going to fizzle out. You know, these no, kids, no. they've got they've got to enjoy it, you know, and things like that. You know, whereas when you were riding at sort of like Zach's age, on 21 sort of level, things were fun. No pressure. Yeah, right. You, you <laughs> roll up to a meeting, they expect you to score five, six points maybe, and then you go and get eight or nine. And they didn't expect it sort of thing. Exactly. And I think it, a lot of it's with the times as well, obviously with social media. Mm. Um, you get a lot of people have a lot of say-so and don't realise what sort of pressure and stress that puts on riders. Mm. Um so yeah, there's a lot to answer for, um, and nowadays you do have to be a hell of a lot of a, a lot stronger than what people were back then. Yeah, because like I say, you're exposed everywhere nowadays. Unfortunately, you know it's just the way of the world. But um, you then managed to make a comeback a couple of times. I think it was with Lakeside. You did it at National League level first. You mm-hmm. came back and helped them out. You know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I got I got slated for that because I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't be riding in this league. But at the end of the day, I was doing it to help the kids out. Yeah. Um, I didn't plan on riding. You know, I didn't want to... If I wanted to go there, I would have went there from the start of the season. But because I had a few injuries and they couldn't find a rider to replace them or do whatever, they asked me. So I said, yeah, of course I would. Um, and it was it was really enjoyable mm-hmm. because you had Alfie Botel there that, bless him, he's a, he's a good rider and he, yeah. he's got to work hard at it. Um, and he, he's slowly coming through. And I could see what he was doing. He was charging into the corners, wanting to be a speedo rider, but then going wide. And yeah. then it just leaving a massive gap and vulnerable up the inside every time. So I'd team ride with him. Mm. I'd just let him go into the corner and sit around the inside, protect him. And we got quite a few five ones like that. And it just showed him sort of what to do, really. Mm. Um, and that's all I'm probably going to do this year. 
you know, yeah. just sort of help everyone and and just bring a little bit of fun into it and a bit of team spirit and team riding. Yeah, because I think it was when you rocked up, I think, again, at Dan Eastbourne in the National League, you think, oh, bloody hell, Paul Harry, is it? He's on for a maximum tonight. You know, <laughs> things like that. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, no, I don't think he did, no. But it's like, it's like that sort of thing. You think, oh, well, because obviously you've done so much and things like that. Rocking up in, what was it? I think it was PK's Kevlar's, PK's bikes. And then, <laughs> you went, hang on, is this Paul Harry and Peter Carlson turned up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it. I didn't, I didn't have the money to go and spend. Um, and... Really and truly, in that league, you shouldn't really be spending fortunes because it's not all about that. It's about learning and developing riders. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I felt that I didn't, I didn't want to do it, spend money and, and sort of, yeah, defeat the object, really. It's yeah, about exactly. sort of helping the kids and enjoying yourself. Yeah. And obviously then you went on to, I think you had a, a couple of years out again, and then you went on to, to ride for Kent for, again, second half of the season uh, there. That must have been a, a nice thing to work underneath Len Silver sort of thing. And, again, bring the kids on as much as you can, hopefully try and do well with the club. Yeah, um, that's all it is about, really. He, he was short of riders, and there's obviously a lack of riders at the moment. Yeah. Um, so if I could help him out, then I always said, like, Len, if you're ever short, just give me a shout. And he did. Mm. Um yeah, it's difficult because you go in there and you've got that sort of target on your back. Obviously, you've been previous sort of rider race or whatever. Yeah. Um, people aim for you. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, what it's about, isn't it? It's, it's, it's competitive. Yeah, it's enjoyable. That, that's the main thing. As long as you're enjoying yourself, that's the main thing. Again, exactly. And obviously, nowadays, we don't have places like Hackney where you can go and pay your money and ride your bike. Mm. Um, and I like riding my speedo bike, so that's what and, I want to do. Yeah, so obviously, what the fun you have on the speedway then reflects on the grass track and things like that. Then, because obviously you go on to do well next. I think you, then you finish like runner-up or third place in the Masters and getting things like that. And it's it's good results for yourself, even though the kids behind you are chasing you. You're still beating them. It's all good fun. Yeah, it is, and it's it's different now. Um, obviously, back in the day when you wanted to win every meeting, nowadays you go there just to sort of enjoy yourself and see how yeah see what you can do. Mm. Um, I don't put no pressure on myself. I'm not there to to pay the mortgage anymore. Um, and it, it's nice, obviously, helping Zach, seeing him do so well. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit strange when you're on the start line and he's next to you and you're sort of racing each other. Um, but you, you can never race each other. I can't race him. Like, if he goes into the corner, I don't feel that I want to bomb dive him. Yeah. Because I don't want to clean him up. He's my little mate. I'm not going to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's different, but it's enjoyable. So... Mm. Yeah, it's a different sort of enjoyment, isn't it? You know, it's like I say, you're not chasing for uh, to be the best. You're there just to enjoy yourself and have a, and have a laugh, sort of thing. Which is, I can imagine, what's going to happen this year in 2021 when you when you ride for Kent this year. Yeah, it's just about rocking up and, and having a skid and enjoying yourself. Obviously, yeah, we've got Scott in the team, and the last sort of year or two, we've seen quite a bit of each other with him living in Brighton and. Yeah, getting out and about. He's come up and stayed here and I've been down there and we've done a bit of training together and yeah, no, it's, it's been good. So it's, it'd be nice just to get out and, and ride with Scott and have a laugh again. Yeah, the two sort of older older boys in the team <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, yeah, older boys trying to take on the youngsters. But no, we <laughs> we just enjoy riding our bikes. You know, like we said before, we, we grew up on junior grass track um, and you just want to ride your bike and have fun really. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, if you can get a sort of fun atmosphere going at Kent, I'm sure the club itself will excel. Because obviously, again, they're riding in the National League as well. So, again, two teams, you know, and you could probably help out the youngsters if you go along to a National League meeting. Yeah, and it, it, it's nice because you hopefully there'll be youngsters from sort of local areas as well. Mm. Um, and it, that's what it's about, really. Um, I don't think I would ride, I wouldn't have ride for any other club. Yeah. Um, but being local... It's that friendly family thing, isn't it? It's trying yeah. to get them sort of people back that used to come mm. or watch. Um, and then it, it sort of rolls on from there. Then the youngsters come, they take an interest, they want to get a bite, and then it starts the ball rolling. Mm. Um, and then hopefully, like in years to come, we might have a few more that are sort of a bit keen to do it. Yeah, fingers crossed, because obviously we've got, we've got to some, somewhere build on something to, to move forward. Cause unfortunately, it likes yourself, Scotty, uh, and people like that ain't going to be around forever. They, you're going to stop fully, well, hopefully, <laughs> and things <laughs> like that, <laughs> and things yeah. like that. But uh, you need to honestly like Zach, 
James and people like that to take on the mantle of yourselves and things like that. Yeah, it's right. You just want to sort of build a sort of, some sort of foundation, I suppose. Mm. Um, I mean, ideally, like I say, you'd, you'd get people, local people wanting to do it, see Zach and see James and then think, oh, we can do that. And then they go to Iwade, support Iwade, and then from Iwade they go to Sittingbourne and, and it's like a knock-on effect, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then you, if you do, if they do that, you've then got sort of, yeah, Kent, Eastbourne, the local. Mm. Um, and then it creates that that sort of interest for locals as well. Mm. You know, and you just hope that it keeps on going. Yeah, because you look at the likes of Eastbourne having Dave Norris, Dean Barker, Martin for so many years, but then that was the local interest to keep people coming back because they knew yeah. Dean, Dave and Martin and things like that. So it was a good thing in one respect, but not a good thing in the other respects. I don't think the, the freshness of the club didn't change too much. But, you know, like you say, if you get local talent and things like that, because obviously um, with Ken and Iway, they support the local grass tracks as well like you yeah. said, Frittenden and places like that, like with yourself. So it's a, it's a big old big old circle. So if you keep it all going, it hopefully in a few years, you better get something out of it. You'd like to think so. Mm. Um, and that's what it's about really, isn't it? You're just trying to keep sort of people interested and keep people happy. Um, and yeah, just keep sort of, yeah, track racing going really. Yeah, exactly. Have you managed to get um, any big meetings at Frittenden or Dig Dog Lane this year? Um, I don't know if I will or not. Um, there comes a time when you sort of, your enthusiasm goes a little bit. Yeah. Um, and obviously riding Speedway, I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, looking forward to that. Mm. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not not going to ride. Um, there's a track just down the back of me, a grafty green. Um, mm. Makes an aces run there. I might do that one. Um, but I'll probably only do the meetings that I want to do and the tracks I like riding. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably what I do. Yeah. Pick and choose where you want to go. Yeah, it's, it's obviously, I'm, <laughs> I'll be 46 this year, so I just want to enjoy myself and, yeah, sort of enjoy riding my bike and, yeah, stay safe, really. Come out unscathed. <laughs> yeah, bit of first, isn't it? <laughs> well, first for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, I must wrap this up tonight, Paul. It's been great talking to you, mate, and hearing, and hearing a lot of your, your stories and, and things like that tonight. Um, hopefully you've nice. enjoyed it. <laughs> No, yeah, it's been different. Yeah, it's been a bit different. Yeah, but uh, I must have been little shout outs, which is thanks everyone for watching again tonight. Um, go like our pages on Facebook and everything and subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're all over the place with this sort of thing now. So it's getting really, really good. So hopefully the next one will be just as good as this one, if not, maybe a bit better. You know, you never know. But um, cheers tonight, Paul, for your, for your time and everything and cheers, enjoy mate. your evening. And you. Take care. Take care, mate.